everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, thank you for uploading the video of week three. That was fantastic. Um, but I realized that all of you are very serious. Well, except for <laughs> but she sang her song, which is brilliant. So next time I expect all of you to do some dance or something, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, it's fine. It's probably one of your first video logs to be posted up. So, but you get a lot more chance to do what, uh, what I mean, you get a lot more chance in this module to do uh, out videos and discussions and stuff. I think one of the main things you need to remember is that, um, yeah, it's quite serious stuff. We're all doing a master's, and, but it, it doesn't mean that we can't have fun as well. And the reason why I've included videos and doing silly stuff like that well, it's actually not quite silly. There is a reason for why, why we're doing that. It's because uh, I want you to enjoy. A lot of times when we go into a study uh, module, we don't really enjoy what most of the time we don't enjoy. Some occasionally we do enjoy. But I want you guys to be engaged, and the main thing is to enjoy. But partly, another reason why I'm using videos is because a lot of, I mean, you'll be full time. But there are some part timers as well as people who are online as well. We expect more people to join us in this module. So that means that uh, we have to have some form of interaction. Otherwise, um, it may be that, it, and it really depends on the year, sometimes the full-time group is small and the online group is large. So who, you won't have a lot of interaction amounts you, which is nice you're having a small group, but you will want to leverage on the experience of some of the people who are studying it online. So for the online people, you would also want to think about leveraging on some of the expertise that the full-timers who are on campus have, but it's also that interaction as well, knowing other people, clinicians that you interact uh, with in other places. Who knows, one day that you might visit that country and you go, hi, I'm coming to you, can I visit you? And you make friends that way and I can, I can tell you um, how many times I've uh, made friends online or previous classmates from different countries and then when I do visit, I, I uh, do visit their country, I tend to go visit them or visit their clinics as well just to find out what they do for a living. So, so just keep that in mind and that's the reason why we're doing this. I know all of you know who I am. I don't need to reintroduce myself, but just in case my benefit of those who haven't been following us for the past five weeks, my name is Chiwi. Uh, you can just call me Chiwi, you don't need to call any of my title because it doesn't really matter. It just means I studied really hard. Um, uh, I'm, I'm from Singapore and um, I've been in this country for quite some time. I studied in London and then my undergraduate in London, but I went back home to Singapore to practice. I was in the, um, I was in the military, so I was a um, over soldier as well as a therapist within the, um, the, uh, the armed forces in my country. And then after that, I joined the public sector. So during the public sector, you usually do the things you usually do as a junior physio. Around. And then the very last place that I was at, which I loved and specialized in, was in HIV rehabilitation. Uh, some of you may know me that I am into pain management. You know, what? HIV, AIDS, rehabilitation, and pain? Well, there are a lot of conditions within. For, for those of you who know about HIV re rehabilitation, is that these, um, these people have got an immunocompromised system and therefore. They are much more liable for all sorts of infections. Some of these viruses and bacteria might attack the neurological system, might attack um, a lot of different systems in general. And because of those infections, there is a lot of pain involved, especially if it attacks the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. And that's why I got interested in that. Therefore, because of that, that led me to my postgraduate studies. I actually came here, they offered me a scholarship to do my uh, PhD here after which they offer me a job. So if they offer you a job, you don't say no. Um, and then uh, that, that's when I settled here and uh, I've been here for quite some time now. Um, I've got obviously a wife and two boys. You see one of my boys, the other boy tends not to go into videos, so that's fine. Uh, you sometimes occasionally hear him in the background. So that's a bit about me. Um, now, in this particular lecture, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to call it a lecture because I'm going to talk to you a lot and I like to talk, okay, I like to talk even though I'm a bit of an introvert but when I am in my lecture or clinician I just go yeah, 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 yeah I just can't stop uh, and you know people have to physically 
restrain me, you know, stop me from talking. So I'm just going to say that this is a lecture, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're, we're going to um, look at um, several things. These are all very logistic stuff. So things like why are we doing this? Okay, and um, some of the aims and learning outcomes. Well, you probably have read them, but I'm just going to simplify the learning outcomes for you. Because sometimes when you read learning outcomes and aims, it goes blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what you hear when you read the words in your head. It's a bit like, you know, a Simpsons dog. When, when the family is talking, all the dog here is blah, 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 blah. Exactly. That's, which is why I'm here to simplify the aims and the learning outcomes for you. And I want to give you a bit about logistics. I mean, you've gone through five weeks. But let me just give you an overview of the entire module throughout the year. This is, this is a very long module. It's going to last until semester two. So, and I've also given you some um, sheets. For those who are online, I'm going to upload this onto the hub so that you can download both the lecture as well as the, um, the, the, the sheet that the students currently are having. It outlines every single week what we'll, what we'll be doing, including the reading that we'll be doing, even though every single week in a weekly folders, I'll still reveal to you, remind you what it's supposed to be. But if you are having a, you know, if, if you're really enjoying the book and it's a really small book, and you put it in your handbag or put it in your bag and you're on a bus, you have nothing to do, you can always just flip it and just have a read. But look, talk about the most important thing that will matter to all of you, which is the assessment. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to pass this module? Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay, it's going to be a lot of work, it's going to be hard work, I'm not going to kid you that this is going to be hard work, but at the same time we're going to have some fun as well, okay. My, my philosophy in doing assessments for myself and when I was a student and for as a lecturer is that when I get students to work hard, I make sure that they have a little bit of fun as well, because otherwise it's really hard to sustain their engagement with the, uh, with the assessment themselves. And then I'll ask you any questions and answers. So it's not personal, you can ask me anything about this module. Okay, so now, aims. Oh, by the way, I put that at arrow that because the entire family now is watching arrow. Uh, for those of you who don't know what arrow is, you should watch it. Uh, <laughs> it's a very good TV series. Um, now, this is the aims of this entire module. Um, there are some things that you probably need to take note of is that because you're doing it at the master's level, is that someone at all? Would you mind just helping me to let him in? Thank you. Um, there are some things, keywords that you need to take note of. Sorry. Come on in, that's fine. Just grab a chair and just join us. Just be careful that we are I'm actually videoing that. So okay. just, just make sure you don't block them, otherwise the online students won't be very happy with you. <laughs> um, so there are certain things and skills that you need to employ. You may have already have them, or you may be still developing them, but the main thing is that you need to um, get your, these skills out and actually use them and show that you're starting to use these skills. The very first thing is, you need to be able to evaluate and critique. Okay, that is extremely difficult for a lot of students, but it's not impossible. Along the way, I mean, you've got your, um, online, uh, what's that? I'm trying to remember what Covey's module is. Online learning, is it? Or is it the prep learning, the, the, the very first one we came in, the very first module that you did the formative for? What's it called? What's that module called? Learning, uh, learning methodology, that's correct. Oh, Covey's going to kill me, I forgot his, the name of his module. Learning methodology, some of these concepts are starting to come out, isn't it? About evaluation and critique. Now, we will be using a lot of that in this module. Yes, we'll be learning about concepts and frameworks and principles behind the properties of outcome measurement and clinical measurements, but in order to be able to do that, you have to look at the evidence behind them and then be able to uh, criticize. When I use critic the word criticize is not in a negative manner. Criticize in academic terminology means that we look at it with, a, with a, a, a much more detail and look at both the pros and the cons so the advantages and the disadvantages, what it's capable of and what it's not capable of. That's what critique is. I know that a lot of, um, in different countries, the way student and tutor interactions are very different and the dynamics are very different as well. I mean, from where I come from as well as in a lot of other countries, is 
the student tutor interaction is such that what the, te what the tutor says is the student should just follow and not question. But you are at a master's level now. What I want you to do is that there is no one, there is no sacred cow you can't slay. Okay? There's no sacred cow that. If for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that you can criticize anything. No matter it's my work or someone famous that you know who's a physio who's very famous and they publish some work, there you can criticize it. You are in a position, so long as you've got skills and you criticize it appropriately and you have a good academic debate about it, it's fine to criticize it. Okay, there's no sacred cow you can slay. And then, obviously, because we are focusing very much on outcome measures and clinical measures in this module, so we need, and, and the final aim is to be able to apply um, our critiquing skills, our evaluation skills, to choosing a type of clinical measurement that is relevant to our own clinical practice. You may have already specialized, or you may not have specialized, it doesn't matter. Because we are learning generic skills, so it can apply across the board. It may, it may, you may change discipline at some point, but those skills still stay relevant. And that's the main good thing about this module. No matter where you go, this, these skills will still be relevant. Okay? So that's what we're trying to do, to choose and effectively use these clinical measurements. But, remember, why are we doing choosing all these clinical measurements and outcome measures? The reason for that is because we care for our patients and service users. I mean, for those of you more commercial, that's why you call them service users, or not in a clinical setting. For example, physios can be working in a community with third sector charities and services that doesn't, you don't usually link to healthcare, so we call them service users. But obviously, it's the main bulk of where our um, um, sort of clients come from are still patients. So, we need to be able to enhance their rehabilitation or the service that we provide them and be able to measure whether they've improved, stayed the same, or got worse. And we want them to improve. How do we then measure so that we can actually convince them that they've improved? Because a lot of times, patients don't believe you that they've improved, despite the fact that they have, and you know that they have. So being able to measure something like that enables you to convince your patients and your service users that, yes, you have improved. Look, look at the chart. This is what happens every week. You have improved. And if you are a service that requires funding, or someone who has uh, oversight over your service, then you can take those same charts, summarize them, and say, look, my patients are improving. What we're doing is effective. And that's the reason why what this module is for. These are all the learning objectives. Okay? So, um, let me see, there are four of them, but all four of them all sort of converge into what I've just told you about the aims. So the aim is an overarching aim, but as we look at the learning objectives, we have sort of broken down into separate categories. The first category is the main overarching framework we'll be using, which is the ICF, the International Classification of Function. We will be using that a lot and thinking about that a lot because that's what physiotherapists use internationally. Okay? It's a common language that physios use internationally. So when we talk about ICF, we talk about impairments talk about activity limitations, or you talk about participation restrictions, or if you use terminology, impairment, disability, and handicap, people will still understand you, and then you can, you're able to transcend that national boundaries to be able to talk to each other. Physios should talk to each other, because we are one big family. In order to safeguard our own interests, we need to be able to talk to each other. So that's what a personal learning objective is, to be able to get you into that mindset of using the ICF. Um, the next learning outcome is mainly concerned with the concepts that is uh, the most relevant to this module in terms of clinical measurements. There are three main ones, obviously there, there can be more than that, but mainly we are talking about validity, reliability and responsiveness. Whenever we talk about an outcome measure or a clinical measurement, these are the three things we think we are concerned about, whether it is measuring what it says it is measuring, whether if we actually um, do it multiple times or different doing uh, different people using the same uh, things on the same patient or on different patients, do they agree? And is it responsive enough to be able to detect change if there was really a clinical change? And over the weeks, we will look at the 
methodologies and the principles surrounding all of these three main concepts and how to actually interpret and be able to use the evidence to look at the ones that you're interested in. Next, all these are grand, all these learning objectives are fantastic. But a lot of times, because physicists are very pragmatic people, after learning about a concept, we always ask ourselves, okay, so now how do I apply this to this one patient which I'm interested in using it on? Okay, you always ask that question, I'm learning that that's alright, but how does it apply to my patient? And this learning outcome will try to apply some of these theories and looking at different methodologies to be able to apply general concepts and filter down to individual patient. Okay. It's actually more difficult than you think it is. But one thing to always remember that um, we may learn the difficult bits, but at the end of the day, when we do use it, we will have to simplify it at some point. Okay, so but you learn the theory, the principle behind filtering down, but when you actually utilize it, it will be much, much simpler because the patient don't really care about what statistics you use, what framework you use. All they want to know is are they going to get better? And when are they going to get better? And how much they're going to get better? And that will point that in that direction. Um, a lot of times, I mean, I don't know about I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of times when I've seen my patient over the years, I've always felt that sometimes I'm not doing any good, or the patient's just not improving the way I want them to do. And when you, when you, when, when you question yourself like that, you think, is it because I'm a terrible physio? Really doing nothing for this patient right here? Or is it because of other sick? Other reasons. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why patients will not improve. Okay, but one of them could be that um, the, you haven't actually evaluated what are the potential uh, roadblocks that might prevent you from effectively implementing a particular clinical measurement. That's one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's the only one, but surrounding that, there are a lot of potential barriers, and towards the end we will talk about what these potential barriers are, what some examples of these potential barriers are, so that when you do go out there back in the clinic, you are able to identify some of these and think about strategies to overcome them. There's no point talking about measuring or um, sort of collecting data and choosing outcome measure. When we, when we go to the core phase of clinical practice, we cannot actually apply them and we cannot overcome the barriers that apply them. I'm not going to tell you that I am perfect in the way I apply clinical measurements out of my because I don't. I have made lots of mistakes along the way. But the main thing is, yes, you made mistakes, but you should learn from them. That's the main thing you should Okay. Any questions so far of me? No? See, do you get what I mean when I do that? I just keep on... Um, now, why are we doing this? I talked about having fun, okay, so I'm not going to... I'm not, I'm not going to go into that anymore. Um, all of us know clinical measurements are very important, and I really also explain to you why, how important that. But the next point is, because it's a movement of evidence-based practice, you may be with it, or you may not be with evidence-based practice, but the fact is that everyone's using it. So, you might as well just jump on the bandwagon, because it, jump onto the bandwagon, because if you don't, you will be left behind, and what will happen is that you, your practice will be much more diminished. Ultimately, it's not you who will suffer, it's the patients who will suffer if you don't use the evidence behind some of these things. And we will teach you over the entire program to be much more evidence-based. Okay? You think that you have engaged in a lot of literature evidence-based in your undergraduate days? Well, you prepared. You're going to engage more. Okay? Now, Another thing in fashion right now, well, not quite in fashion, but over the past five to ten years, is this thing about critical reflective practice. Reflective practice means that you, you don't just do and just carry on with your everyday practice, but what you do is, at the end of the day, or perhaps moments in between your, what you're doing, you think back and, and evaluate yourself and think, oh, why have I done that? What's the reasoning behind that? Because when you, you know when you are in a clinic doing things, you don't think. You just carry on because sometimes you just, firstly you're busy, 
you just want to carry on and just simply do the thing that has worked the previous time. And then you realize that, oh, actually, should I have done that? Or even if it's right, why have I done that? Is it because it saves me time? Or is it because of, for some other reason? Which is why critical reflective practice is very important. It's a bit like, I don't know, um, I, don't, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I used to keep a diary. I mean, men don't keep a diary, actually. Men keep journals. My sister keeps a diary. The psych sister, but there you go. Um, yeah, so, what I do is every single day after I finish the day, uh, after, after I come back from school, I take out my journal or diary, if you like, and then just write and just evaluate what day has happened. That keeps me grounded because as a child, I have. I have lots of emotions going on in my head, and things happen, I may get upset about certain things, but when I come back home, at the end of the day, I can actually step outside and be slightly more objective and going, oh, I'm, I was upset about this, 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 um, John hit me because blah, 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 that's what I said. But then again, I will stand outside and be more objective, but why did I say that to John in the first place? Was it because I didn't like him? Was it because something he did to me? Or was it something else and you can actually think oh if that's the case i mean hope so i'm on one for it's okay you just oh, you are you. you're not in the video anyway <laughs> so for those of you who are online the reason why it stopped and the video quality would have changed slightly and the angle have changed slightly is because my phone ran out of memory so there you go always prepare extra memory okay um because i was trying to video it in 1080 1080p, so it means that it's really, really high, and it needs a lot of memory. I didn't anticipate that it would uh, take up so much. Um, but uh, let's continue on this slide. So we were saying that, um, why are we doing this? I was uh, sort of trying to sort of prepare you, not just for this module, but throughout the entire degree itself, that you'll be very much engaged with evidence-based practice. So it's something that we will be doing, it's very, very important. And I was describing about my own journal, about keeping my thoughts, and then being able to objectively evaluate why I think a certain way. And the main reason for that is so that I can do, do it better the next time. Okay. So in that instance, uh, I actually forgot what I did. Um, I mean, that person isn't called John, I made the name up to protect the cop. The identity of the person, but I actually forgot what I did. But most of the time, either I think that that may not be a very good friend of mine, and therefore I don't interact with them, or if someone I value, I actually make up and then try and see what's what it is, and and uh, and, and I would, might have apologized. I don't know. So that's why we're doing this particular module. How would this entire module run? There are certain things it, it, it should become, have already become quite clear as you were going through the first few weeks. You would have noticed that I put in weekly folders. Yeah? So the weekly folders, now, in other modules, it, they may not do it the same way, but this is how we do it. Is that every single week, there will be some either videos or tasks or reading for you. And when the when the week's folder is exposed to you, usually on a Sunday or a Monday, then you are asked to engage in those tasks for that just that week. I know that some other modules expose it and the week before. And you're supposed to engage the week before, before you come in to class and engage in some activities. But for us, I think it's simpler because of the different um, modes of study, full-time, part-time, online. It's much easier just to do it for that week. I would, I, and I'll talk a little bit about, in terms of task, how we engage, because I don't expect you to engage a task within that week itself. Um, for a lot of the reading, it will be very, very, very difficult, because you need a lot of time to be able to synthesize that knowledge, try and find something to do to engage the task before you actually do it. So we, I tend to give you about a two-week period and I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the future points. Now, weekly learning objectives. For each particular week, we will be engaged with a certain learning objective. It's good to actually have a quick look uh, uh, as to what you're about to do so that you are 
always focused. You don't have a lot of reading, but there's a lot of materials and a lot of new concepts to cover. If you are confused, always go back to the learning objectives for that week and ask yourself, what am I supposed to be learning this week? And then go back to your reading again so that you're much, much more focused. That's one very simple way of doing so. Okay? Of course, you have your weekly reading, and by now, hopefully, you will have some, you have the book by Riddle in some form, either online version, or you have bought a physical copy yourself, or you might have rented. Just to say that if you're renting, it may be better to buy the book rather than actually rent it because it's, the book is getting cheaper by the day. It depends on where you buy it as well. And besides, it's so small, it's a little, it's actually worth the investment because you can bring it, you can, the concepts are not new, therefore I foresee that it's not going to go out of fashion for the next five to ten years. That means that the life of the book will, you, your investment will be spread over five to ten years. It's worth actually investing in the book. Yeah, and I've chosen a small book, which is nice. Um, also, it's, it's not too expensive, but neither is it that cheap either. So it's, it's one of those things. And the reading is okay. It's not too difficult. There are a lot of new concepts, but overall it's got a style that is quite easy to follow. And we will have weekly summary videos. That may or may not happen depending on what you have for that week. Okay, sometimes it's more appropriate to summarize what's happening and there's a lot of things going on. Occasionally it's very simple, like the first few weeks we're just getting you to look at the different YouTube videos that's out there to help you learn about some of these technology, getting yourself familiar with potentially what you might be able to use. And those don't require a weekly summary video. Um, now, let's go to the weekly task. Every single week, most weeks we will have a task. Um, this week, the task has, a, has already been exposed to you. If, if you actually follow, after you do the reading, there will be a, sum, uh, there will be a video, uh, so sort a of summary video type thing. And then the very last section of this week will be the task. What we're asking you to do is choose a pen and paper type clinical measure out, and outcome measure. Using the ICF, I want you to then map out to see whether it's actually measuring impairments activity limitations or participation restrictions and relate that to see to, to, to sort of gauge o overall that particular thing uh, that particular outcome measure or clinical measurement what it's trying to measure at which level okay and just to give you an idea because a lot of physio tools are measured at the impairment level we don't really look at um, participation restrictions or activity limitations. It may be that you may have to find something else to um, measure these two broader domains. And when you engage in those tasks, I'll open up the discussion board for two weeks. I will ask you to put up video logs, which is videos of yourself explaining the task. Some, may, some of you may find it easier to do that, some of you don't, then it's fine. If you don't, then you can use the discussion to um, write out what you found, okay? Uh, and we'll give you two weeks for that. Even though I say that after two weeks, the discussion board will close, officially, I don't make it disappear because you might want to come back again and have a look at what your classmates have written or what you have actually written yourself so that you can, actually, you can um, use that as your own learning, okay? So I, the disc I mean, the monitoring of the discussion board will end. Tutors will look at it after two weeks later. But that doesn't mean that you can't go back and still look at some of the material. So I'll just keep it there for you to look at the material. This is quite useful. Workshops and online collaborative projects. Now, um, Kavi will be doing some of these uh, where if you are online, you'll be able to engage as well. But for the full timers, there are scheduled classes like this and it will be less likely that the next few classes will be just me yakking at you away because you'll be engaged in more active uh, sort of um, doing something or some of it will be geared towards your um, summative assessment which is your first piece of work and some of it will also be geared towards 
your last piece of work. Okay? So you're not doing it for fun or just for the sake of doing it. We get you, use whatever you're doing in class and then feedback into what you are actually doing for, um, for your assessments. Now, then you are asking how do the online students then join us in order to be able to engage. There will be some data collecting just for um, within the class to illustrate certain concepts, Kavi might do some data collecting. The data collection will occur among you, but the online students will be asked, given specific instructions on to collect what data to collect as well. Then you will be exposed to a data sheet, like a spreadsheet that is online, and all of you from every different modes of um, study will come and populate those sheets. And then you have this huge collection of sheets. So no matter where you are, you can actually access it. And then you'll be, you'll be able to then analyze that data collection. So it's accumulation of everything. So that's a bit more collaborative as well, which is quite nice. Okay? And you get to see, you, you, it gives you a sort of taster of potentially how these days international collaboration works. Essentially, that's what we do. We work on different sites. We come together. We, put it, everything online uh, where it's secured but everyone can see what everyone's going to do. Any questions on how we're going to run that in terms of reading from this? Is that okay so far? Yeah, it's not too difficult, isn't it? I try to simplify it as much as possible so that you don't have to think very much. You just basically follow one step and just follow the instructions. Of course, you need to do a thinking behind what you learn but the steps to reach the materials not too much work. Okay. Now, how this is an entire overview of some of the tasks that you do. I will give you sheets and the online students who can download that from the hub. But what, what I've done is I've color coded them. Um, the bits that's coded green is where the learning will occur. A lot of concepts will be imparted to you. So it occurred between weeks five to eleven. So this is week five of the of the um, of the module. So from now until week eleven, you'll be learning stuff, and then you won't do much. Just approaching before Christmas, while you're doing something, but not learning stuff uh, in terms of engaging and reading. And then from starting from next year, beginning of next year, which is week twenty, um, you will start to engage with a lot of the learning content again, and, but that's only for about three weeks. What happens in between? Well, I will get you to do, start doing, the ones that's color-coded blue is where I'll get you to start to think about what you want to do for your assignment. The assignment for part one and part two are linked. Okay? There is another one which is formative, uh, formative assignment as well. By now you know what formative assignment is. It's something that you um, engage in, but you get feedback on how to improve without actually impacting on your um, final mark. All these three are all linked. So what you choose for your part one, will, you will then use that and continue to work on and contribute to the part two. Okay? So you'll be building on what you've already done so that it's not work that's wasted and you completely start completely something new again. Um, why it's been allocated weeks 8, 19, 25, 27, 26 to 33 in blocks is because during those weeks, we, everything that we do we will help you to develop it. You know how when you study, a lot of times, a lot of your assignments or assessments, are uh, the, the, the tutors will give it to you and then you just, okay, go away and do it. Mm -hmm. Here, for this module, no. We want you to help you and discuss with you what you want to do. You already got a assigned tutor, we will help you, um, there will be assigned weeks where the tutors will uh, have a chat with you as to what you can then discuss what you want to do. We will be then be able to tell you, oh, that's a good idea, or oh, not sure, sure about that, you might want to think about this, or, or maybe that's a good idea but you might want to change it so that it becomes much easier for you to engage, okay, so that you don't completely go at a different tangent all together. So that's what, why we do it the way we do it. I'll talk a little bit about more about processes afterwards in the later slides. Now of course, all of us will celebrate Christmas. 
doesn't, you don't have to celebrate Christmas just because you're a Christian. You can celebrate Christmas as well because you're going to go shopping. Very atheist thing to do. Um, so uh, you go enjoy your Christmas. During that period of time, you can use it to engage in writing up the assignment if you want to because this, the um, pending date is in week 20. Okay? So as a Christmas gift, I give you assignment one. <laughs> So you can do whatever you want in that uh, period of time. You can go spend some time, but just make sure that you plan a time out. And the reason why we tell you ahead of time is so that you can plan a time. Because if you don't know when it's supposed to be handed in or what's going to happen, you, don't, you can't plan. The same thing for part two, and your part two handing is in week 34. I can't exactly remember the date, but I'll publish it for you. I really got a date, it's just that I don't have it at the top of my head. Okay. Anything else that we talk about? We've already talked about weeks one to four because that's already happened. You already familiarized yourself with the technology, so we just leave it as that. Now, the assessments. There are three parts, as I told you two summative and one formative. The summative part one is countries of 30%, so not too much, but large enough to motivate you to do some work. And then we will do a formative where you will build, start to build on part two. So this is a trial run for part two, or draft, draft for part two essentially. What you'll be doing here for format two will be essentially what you'll be doing finally for part two, but in a slightly easier form or draft form because you, 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 you don't really know what you're trying to do yet, so you're trying to get some ideas out there, which is why it's not marked. But what we do is you get peer feedback. When I, peer feedback is both classmates online and uh, full-time or part-time, as well as the tutors. All of it will be shared um, on the discussion boards, both as a video, we talk about what you want to do, as well as a little sheet of summary of the, of the content that you want to do for part two. And then we can then give you feedback, because everyone will know what the assignment already will be, because I will be exposing it to you. And then you can say how you can improve, that what I found really good, that not so much, and um, do this, do that. And then we can then help each other get um, a, a better grade. Or if you are not interested in grades, at least you will improve the way you do and evaluate some, or improve the skills as well. That's one way to get that. So the, that, so the formative is really important to, be able to, to, to engage in, to get that feedback. Usually when you do a piece of assessment, you just talk to yourself. But now you've got much more than yourself. You get people giving, telling you. You don't have to take all the ideas in, but you know, giving you some ideas on how to improve it further. And now obviously you need to do this summative part two, where the tutor will guide you as you go along, and that will take up seventy percent. Okay. So, what's the? What do you have to do for part one? Now well, part one is a two thousand word written assignment. So just purely writing, okay, just purely writing for, for now. I, I wanted something slightly more um, interesting, but I, the tutor is saying that oh, gee, too, much, too many interesting things. It's, it's too, don't, don't bombard the students with too much. Go for something slightly more traditional. So I did. I went for a 2,000 word written assignment. It's not a very long piece of work, but neither is it a very short piece of work. So it allows you to put in a lot of content, but yet not overload you at the same time. And the question is this, you need to select one clinical measurement tool, okay, or outcome measure, and then you need to critically appraise it for its, see the three main areas, its validity, its reliability, and its responsiveness. So the three areas. By the time, over the next few weeks, you will know exactly what to look out for, and the classes will engage you in having uh, uh, sort of evaluation tools to help you assess some of these so that you may know exactly what to look up for and what to write in for 2,000 words. And I, at some point next week or the week after, I'll publish more guidelines on how to engage with this assignment as well so that you can get even more guidance. Okay, so I, have a do I don't have it now, it's in the process of, I've written it out but I'm getting the tutors to feedback on it to improve on it so that it becomes clearer. Uh, so it give me about a week or two for that to be published. And it has to be then applied for patient group or clinical discipline. So you have to choose. So it's not just a clinical tool, uh, not just a clinical measurement tool or a measure, but it has to be applied to certain population. And the reason why is because 
uh, certain tool applied to different populations can mean very different things or the way their properties might change for different groups. So you have to specifically state which type of Asian group or clinical discipline. If you are aware that this particular program on your transcript, you can tailor it to your own clinical discipline or clinical specialty. So I would encourage you to choose a patient group or clinical discipline that you would want to either that you're currently doing now, that you want to specialize in, or you would like to specialize in the future to, that will contribute towards the transcript of your MSc uh, degree. Okay, so this is one way to tailor make your own uh, program, your own degree. So I encourage you to do that. Um, as I said before, you are really doing stuff in the um, during the class that will help you to develop this particular. Um, written assignment. So during that class, we will focus on that. Thirty percent. I will skip that because I already said that. So how do we do it? So from weeks eight to fourteen, you can see eight to nineteen actually. You can see that in week eight, you will have a video or face-to-face -face chat, depending on which mode of study you are at. So uh, with your assigned tutors. So you know who your assigned tutors are. Um, there are only three of us, it's me, Kath and Kavi. So they will, you will um, just email them and have a chat about exploring what, which topic, which clinical measurement tool and which patient group you want to engage in. And then they will give you advice on that. So that's what you need to do in week eight. In week nine, you'll fill in a search strategy form for a chosen tool. Okay? You'll be given a form that has got all the um, search strategy in it um, that will guide you. You can go beyond that if you want to, but using that, it will at least guide you as to what you're looking out for. Fill in that um, to choose um, to be able to find. Is a strategy, is a, like a little plan to how do you search for literature that supports the evidence behind that tool to answer the validity, reliability, and responsiveness question. After you've done that, you're supposed to email it to your assigned tutor, and the assigned tutor will then give you feedback by uh, putting comments on your sheet and emailing it back to you so that you can actually improve on the search strategy. Okay, so that will have tutor input. After which, if you want, you can um, talk to your um, tutor in week 10. If you, there are certain things that you don't understand what the tutor meant, you can clarify it with them either via email or via uh, online or face-to-face -face chats. Okay, so it will support you with that. And once you are certain what you want to do, you can then go on and collect data, collect the literature, and go to do the searches on the online databases. Okay, or if you, uh, if, if you want, these days Google Scholar is getting better and better, so you can do that as well if you want to. But don't just use Google Scholar, have a combination of different types of data. And then, what you do next is, uh, in week 11, you bring in all the literature you collected. So once you've done the search, you bring in the literature, okay? And then you will do some activities with, uh, I think it's Kavi, who will then help you to teach you how to um, critically appraise this literature in terms of their properties. That's what we do. In week 12, continue to search for liter literature and then in week 13, you will again discuss uh, how you're doing with the tutor again. So you can see that the tutors are there to guide you to the, through the entire process until you start the assignment writing in weeks 14 to 19 where you start to write it. And then you're assigned, you hand it in in weeks 20. Got that? Okay. So quite a lot, but you're not doing it on your own. How many hours is this um, lecture? Three hours? Three, yeah. oh, let's just hope not. Let's that, 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 not use three. That, let's just stick with less than two. Mm -hmm. uh, or less than one, but I don't think I can let be less than one because I already used up going uh, 10 minutes of your time. So, but anyway, so let's, 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 let's talk about the second, second assessment. The second assessment, the format is a 20 minutes video presentation. And then 1,500 words of accompanying notes, right? Okay. So 
just put everything in context. This will be handed in in semester 2, in week 34. So now it's what, week 5? You got 29 weeks. Divided by 4, 7 months. Okay? I mean, if you do a certain thing for 7 months every single week, hopefully you get better, right? Right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Not very confident, right? There, but yeah, I'll take it anyway. So you got seven months to sort of basically prepare these skills, okay? So don't. And on, along the way, we will help you anyway. So you'll be fine. Um, well, so what's the question? For this question, it will be building on what you've done in part one. You you really chose firstly in part one. You chosen a clinical measurement tool. You've chosen a patient group, you've already done that. You've criticized, you've, you've, you've critiqued their validity, reliability, and uh, responses. So we won't go there anymore because it's done and dusted. We now move on. The next bit for part, for part two, you're supposed to identify two barriers. So now it's about more about implementation and application of the clinical measurement tool. You're supposed to identify two barriers that may prevent you successfully implementing the tool in the patient group and Okay? So, um, but it's just not, it's, it's not simply identifying the two barriers. You also have to look at the literature to see for these two barriers, what are the potential impact on this patient group. Okay, so there will be literature out there to say that um, these are the problems that we face. And you're supposed to look for those and then assess how it might prevent you from successfully implementing that clinical measurement tool. Next. When we identify barriers, we don't just leave it at that. We need to come up with solutions as well. So then you have to give us solutions for how to overcome these barriers and problems. Okay. And you also need to then put a little bit of evidence behind it to say that whether this will work or not. Or is there some evidence to suggest that it might or might not work? Okay. And it will contribute to about 70%. So, what does it mean by 20 minute video presentation? It can be anything. It can be a PowerPoint narrated presentation, like what I did this week. Or it could be a um, person, uh, it could be standing in front of a board and just doing that, and you tape yourself for 20 minutes. Okay? Uh, or it could be um, you videoing. If you're online or you're in a clinic or you do have, you are still working in a clinic, you can do uh, video. Um, things that's happening in the clinic and then put it together a video but it has to address all of these points. The format is a bit more fluid but the main point needs to come through. But the question you might be asking, how would I then say what evidence is, uh, how, how do I state and cite the evidence and that's what your 1,500 note accompanying notes is for, is that at certain points you'll refer to this particular author, and then in your accompanying notes, you will be summarizing that bit of the presentation anyway, and that's where you put the literature in, and then you can then have a reference list. By the way, the reference list does not come, count towards the word count, so which means that you can give appropriate referencing. Got that? Understand? I'll give you, a, again, I'll give you more details as to what's, what's expected of you for the next few weeks. So again, this is how we will support you. So week 22 is already about second or third week of semester two, and that's after Christmas, and it should be about in mid-January, towards the end of January, where you start to plan the outline of the video assignment. So you remember you were handing in your first assignment in week 20, so I'll give you a breather for two weeks, and then you start planning for your second, second assignment. And then you uh, plan the outline. Uh, you may talk to your tutors, so through email or through online or through face-to-face -face contact. Doesn't matter. After which you write a draft of what you want to put in into your uh, video presentation. So the content what you want to put in. Um, you can then in week twenty-three you're suppo supposed to after chatting with a tutor refine the outline further so that you know exactly what you want to put in and finalizing everything and then start to write the draft content because what you're currently doing is only the outline of everything now you put in the actual content of what you're going to put in the video 
what you're gonna say, okay, like how you do a prep for, for a presentation. And then in um, in week 25, what I want you to do is make a short five minute video of what you have already done, what you plan to do with the draft outline, because you've written that, put it outline, and then each of you will look at each other and give comments. Okay? I haven't decided whether to pair you off or to just let everyone comment on everybody's. I'll, I'll come to that. I'll make that decision later on. Okay, see which is most effective. So I will also comment on that. So make full use of that. After the comments have been given in week 25, we'll, in week 26, you start to write the thing, uh, the video itself, because now you know exactly what to improve on. You start writing more content. Then you can get some support from your tutors. You can ask, you see, if you've got certain questions, you can ask your tutor in week 26. In week 27, you're working on your own. You can see that the tutor comes in every two weeks to make sure that you're okay. Again, week 28, you, you, you have to start develop video recording some of your content. Okay, if you're not doing it one-off, and then you can start planning to do bits and pieces and then piece them together. Which is what we do. Which is why in the first four weeks, I've taught, I've shown you with YouTube videos of what, how to actually use some of these video editing software just to help you to do that. Okay, and or the PowerPoint um, narrator lectures. If you need any technical support, for example, you come stuck with a technology. Um, the assigned tutor is essentially me. I'm the only tutor in the group that will be helping you with the technical support. So that I'm um, the person to come to. But do tell your assign you to put a content as well so that they know exactly um, that you are, know exactly what you're talking to me about. 29, continue recording. 30, start editing the video. If you have not finished recording, continue recording. Uh, but again, you get to talk to me if you've got any issues with your technical aspects of that stuff. 31, again, continue editing your content. 32, editing your content with support from me. And finally, by week 33, you should be finalizing your final video. Okay, it should be the final product you are mostly happy with. I, I know that physios are, a lot of us are perfectionists, we want to do it right. But the thing is, at some point, you have to hand in your work. So you can only just get it as right as you can. And then that's week 34, you hand in your presentation. Okay, with the notes. And we'll mark both. We talk about that as a five minute for the formative. Now, why is it important to get feedback from each other? Because we need to help each other out. I don't know about where, I, I, I don't know where you studied, so I don't know how that culture or the marking scheme, how, how, how they mark, but I do know that certain universities mark on a curve, so which means that every single year there are only a few people who can get very good marks. Okay, but in this program, in this university, we don't. If your work is good, you meet the criteria for A star or A. In theory, all of you can get an A star or an A. And that's the reason why it's good to give each other feedback, to help each other achieve that A or A star. And sometimes peer feedback and Twitter feedback can push you from, uh, let's say, from one grade, one lower grade to the next grade. Okay? So it's very important for you to engage in this. So it's not just putting in a uh, content for people to peer assess, but also be able to contribute and advise other people as well, so that you learn from each other. Right. So, any questions for me? No? If, for those of you who are online, you've got questions for me, what you can do is just simply um, email me. That's the best way to actually ask me questions. I will put up these slides onto the hub as well so you can download them. If there are no questions, thank you very much. That's the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.